Okay, guys, so now we're going to talk about um, how the body changes with pregnancy. So the general body system changes. So what's interesting, um, you're going to have a lot of increased blood volume when you become pregnant. Of course, um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, first is to gain more blood volume and travel volume to the placenta. Um, and the next is, is the body's way of compensating for loss of blood at delivery. So your body really increases um, a lot of blood volume. So your heart rate goes up slightly, 10 to 15 beats, nothing significant. Blood volume increases. This is the biggest one by 1500 mLs. So you guys, then it is when you have you know twins, it goes up by double. Um, so you have a lot of extra fluid on board. So if you already have heart trouble, think about your body trying to circulate this extra fluid. So the composition is different than our regular blood. So it is mostly plasma. Um, so you have more plasma than you have RBCs, which is really hemodilution. And so what happens is when you get this significant blood volume, every single woman is in a state of physiologic anemia. So because her blood volume is so diluted um, by this extra thousand mils of plasma volume. So this is why every woman who's pregnant needs to get take their um, prenatal vitamin. So we have to check them for iron deficiency. Um, because they're anemic. Um, so once they dip down below 10.5 during pregnancy, we really start to worry about major pregnancy anemia um, for the baby and for her. So um, in the first, your blood pressure changes, um, pretty much it shouldn't change. Um, other than the first, it remains the same. The second, it decreases slightly because you have a big vasodilation uh, to accompany all of this extra blood volume. And then third semester, th third not third semester, third trimester, it returns to normal. Of course, we know that the inferior vena cava is the big vessel that brings blood to the right atrium. And if you lay patients flat on their back that are pregnant, that big gigantic uterus presses on uh, the vena cava and it will, um, it will give you a, um, a falsely low blood pressure because you've squished it in effect with the big gigantic uterus holding a baby pressing on that vessel which is not good and can make mom um, super lightheaded things like that respiratory status should remain the same of course your oxygen requirements increase because there's lots of oxygen going to the gap um, but you should have the same rate. Of course, as the uterus grows, it presses on the diaphragm. It pushes up. And so you can't get as deep of a breath because you have this big, gigantic uterus sitting right below your diaphragm. Um, the progesterone causes the smooth walls of the ureters to dilate and relax um, because of the estrogen and progesterone. Urine can stagnate and you can have increased UTIs. Um, we do test women every single um, time they come into the office for, um, for infection in their urine. We do a urine dip and we check for um, blood, which would tell us there's an infection. Um, nitrite, which are split bacterial products, that tells us there's an infection. Um, white cells may or may not be. Um, then we also check for protein, which can tell us that the, there's high pressure in the kidneys. Um, and then, of course, we check for ketones to see if someone is muscle wasting um, due to you know, vomiting. But we always are checking for urine UTIs. They are a lot of times completely asymptomatic, um, and we don't want them to have a UTI that ascends to their kidneys and gives them pyelonephritis. Um, the urinary frequency, of course, the bladder is sensitive because now you have all these hormones and you have an enlarged uterus pressing on it. And then late gestation, um, the uterus is gigantic and the head is pressing on the bladder. So that can cause us to have to use the restroom. Obviously, the uterus grows laterally as well and can put pressure on the ureters. And so we can have um, changes in blood flow, blood flow to and from the kidney and we can have pressure on the ureters so we can have some um, problems getting rid of urine. 
musculoskeletal, remember relaxin is that hormone um, that allows the ligaments to stretch. Now this is not specific to your pelvis. Uh, we would like for that to be, <laughs> but it is not specific to your pelvis. So if you lift a large amounts of weight during pregnancy, it can damage or loosen those ligaments. Um, sadly, um, women are in good shape um, when they are um, get pregnant most of the time and they do lift a lot of weights and they don't see the muscle injury during the pregnancy when they're actually lifting. Um, it can be seen after uh, delivery and then also it can be seen many years later um, due to the ligament instability. So you guys, gastrointestinal, so here's all of your, your ileum and your colon, and you can see here's your stomach. So here's your colon and here's your ileum. So as the baby um, gets bigger, um, it displaces this, and this can give you co constipation and nausea and all this stuff. But look here at nine months, how big and gigantic this uterus is. It presses on the colon. So you can have periods of diarrhea, um, and then it presses on the stomach, so you can't eat very much. You can see there how small the stomach is. Um, and then it presses on your diaphragm, so it's hard to breathe. So you can see that we have a lot of changes um, regarding this uterus occupying the space in the abdomen. Discomforts of pregnancy. So the first trimester, emotionally, um, People, you know, take a pregnancy test and they're like, wait, should I have done this? <laughs> Is what, what, I don't know about this. Um, and then, of course, you look at yourself as the primary focus. I'm pregnant instead of I'm, I'm going to have a baby because it really only affects you at this moment. You don't really feel the baby, so you don't feel a second entity. Second trimester, when the baby starts to move, that's also called quickening. You start to think of the, the baby as a separate entity. Um, narcissism and introversion, like you want to make sure that you do the right thing, wear the right clothes, you do everything wonderful for this baby. Um, body image, proud of your abdomen and breasts, you know, because they're enlarging and you feel beautiful and your um, uterus is, is enlarging and people can tell you're pregnant. Um, maybe negative, you have stretch marks, too much weight gain, um, plasma, and then change in, in sexuality. Remember, we have a lot of extra blood volume, about 1,500 extra cc's. So, um, you know, we have blood changes to the genital area. So um, there's increased um, sensitivity of the genital organs um, and pelvic congestion, and that can increase sexual uh, sensations. Third trimester, you're kind of scared, you're vulnerable, like, I don't want to go out there, I don't want my baby to get sick. And you're, a lot of times, the patient has increased um, dependence on nurse, doctor, um, significant other, um, need reassurance and love, um, preparation for birth, making sure you're getting everything done correctly, going to childbirth classes. Um, how well if I'm in labor and we do extensive teaching and moms get scared and want to know, you know, how will I know? Wants to see the baby and prepares the nursery. So psychological responses, paternal um, ambivalence, like so many times the significant other um, does not, um, I should say paternal or significant other um, instead of just paternal because, you know, women who are partners to women um, can have these same exact feelings. So ambivalence, um, fetus is a potential baby, um, not a baby until it comes out. I may feel left out because all the attention is on the mother. Um, trying on fatherhood or motherhood for the first time. Um, so, you know, you're a partner to the person who's pregnant, so you're trying to adapt. Um, but kuvad is a word that um, is an, an important word um, because it's the meaning is the unintentional development of physical signs and symptoms associated with pregnancy. So when mom says, I need some pickles and um, ice cream, um, the kuvad will force the, well, not force, but is the act of the significant other saying, well, I need it too. And so, of course, when you're both eating pickles and ice cream, you can have increased weight gain. And of course, when you gain weight in your abdomen, it puts extensive pressure on the back. So then you can have back aches. So Kuvada, the unintentional um, development of physical signs associated with pregnancy. Assessment of the pregnant patient. So here's our schedule that we like, ideally before 10 weeks, so that we can talk to her about 
avoidance of teratogens. And you guys, this should be in prenatal counseling. So pretty much anybody you have, if they're thinking about getting pregnant in the next couple of years, you should talk to them about taking a multivitamin every day to get enough folic acid um, to prevent um, um, neurotube defects such as spina bifida, microcephaly, anencephaly. Um, and then avoidance of teratogens. So stay away from, you know, chemotherapy, um, radiation, um, many things like that. So ideally before 10 weeks. After 10 weeks, we're going to see them every four weeks until 32 weeks. And then we know that our placenta is aging and our baby's getting older and we have more vascular issues after 32 weeks. So we see them every two weeks until 36 weeks. Then after 36 weeks, we see them every week until birth. And one of the biggest things there is making sure that mom is feeling the baby move consistently. Um, fetal kit counts are an important thing to make sure um, that they're consistent. Um, we also have reduced schedule visits are being promoted for people who don't want to come as much and also televisits um, while we are in um, having a difficult time with COVID. So, and then they also have group prenatal cares as well. This is showing when you go to the office, this is our standardized um, ACOG record. You can see here's the date when you came, how many weeks you were, so let's say like 38 weeks. Your fundal height should be um, plus or minus two of your due date, of your gestational age. So hopefully this is somewhere between 36 and 40. Presentation, hopefully it's cephalic or head down. What the heart rate is, it should be somewhere between 110 and 160. Hopefully you got you know, fetal movement, preterm labor signs and symptoms. Hopefully they're absent, but symptoms of preterm labor can be contractions more than four in an hour, pain, um, low back pain, cervical dilation, um, things of that nature. If you had a cervical exam at 38 weeks, it would tell us the dilation, effacement, and station, your blood pressure. Do you have edema? So we, everybody has a little bit of leg edema, but you should never have facial or hand edema your weight. And remember I told you we always check the urine. This one is for glucose and albumin. We always check for glucose too because of gestational diabetes and albumin or protein for um, preeclampsia. And then of course we're checking for infection. Your next appointment and your provider's signature. Okay. And so now this one is our drug allergy and religious and cultural considerations, which is really important. We really want to respect um, the culture or religious um, values of the patient. And then we want to have their drug allergy. If we plan for an anesthesia consult, anybody who's had back surgery, we always try to get them into anesthesia. If they have like rods in their back or anything at all like that, we make sure and send them in because they may or may not be a candidate um, for epidural anesthesia. So anytime somebody's had any kind of back issues with surgery, we want to plan for them an anesthesia consult. Also, if there are any kind of high risk, such as problems um, with blood clotting and just anything at all that would affect anesthesia, we go ahead and send them before they go into labor. So her story is the feminine version of history. So we have a lot of factors in the history. Um, does she speak English or what language does she speak? And of course, we'd want to use the language line. Um, if she did not speak English, how she prefers to be addressed, um, religious or cultural beliefs and practices, diet, and a lot of that diet goes back to culture. So we got to make sure that she's not eating anything that would be um, problematic. Use of medications. So is she using any over-the-counter medications, prescription medications? What's going on there? Herbal therapy. And what are the expectations of her provider? Like, what does she want from these visits? Because sometimes people want to come in and they just want you to listen to the heartbeat, measure, weigh them, and send them on their way. Other ones have more greater expectations where they need more counseling or they, they need things. So you have to be really, um, really cognizant of what people need. And as a bedside nurse, um, that's really important too. Like you want to make sure that you meet the needs of your patient. So risk factors, um, low income or educational level. Um, this is just because they haven't been, they don't either have economic means to getting the food that they are advised to get an educational level. They don't understand the, um, the reasons or the potential 
um, for what can happen. Poor diet, weight under 100 pounds is definitely a risk factor and over 200 pounds for gestational diabetes. Under 16 for developmental um, maturity and for, um, I mean, because they're still developing, it's very difficult. Um, then over 35, um, because, you know, that's a little, that's advanced maternal age. And so sometimes you need a little bit more assistance because you're, you know, you, you're in a pattern and sometimes it's more difficult to break the pattern that you're in, your lifestyle. Um, social and personal factors, um, smoking, of course, we know that smoking um, vasodilates and constricts um, the vessels, so it can cause major damage to the placenta, and we can have a small baby. Use of addicting drugs, such as like cocaine, um, opioids, um, those, you know, can definitely cause problems with the baby, um, problems with mom, problems with the vasculature. Um, use of prescriptive medications. Um, what kind of medications are you on? What are the drug classes? Are they safe? Uh, so we have to review that stuff. And excessive alcohol consumption. So for you guys, excessive alcohol consumption in pregnancy is any alcohol consumption during pregnancy. We don't know the magic number to what causes fetal alcohol syndrome, how much alcohol causes it. So we have to say none. And we can't study the pregnant population because they are a vulnerable population so and we can't we have to say no alcohol no alcohol whatsoever um pre-existing medical conditions so i say that you guys if you have a vascular or endocrine disorder it's going to get worse the end so because we this is about vascular changes and endocrine changes and then of course with this enlarging uterus if you have any abdominal issues that can get worse so uh, diabetes, of course, um, human placental lactogen um, causes more insulin resistance. So if you already have diabetes, walking into the pregnancy, it 100% is going to get worse. Cardiac disease, if you already have vascular problems walking into the pregnancy, we know it's going to get worse because we're going to have extra blood volume on the vasculature. Anemia, again, um, we know that pregnancy is a, is a condition of physiologic anemia. So that extra 1500 blood volume, that's mostly plasma, is going to make the anemia that you had walking in there even worse. Hypertension, of course, blood volume again. Um, so hypertension is when the um, blood vessel is constricted. So if you have a constricted blood vessel that's causing an elevated number, and then you put on this extra blood volume, it's only going to get worse. Thyroid disorder, um, of course, that's an endocrine um, problem. And we know that the thyroid enlarges by up to a third during pregnancy. So if you already have a thyroid disorder walking into the pregnancy, you can expect it to get worse. And then renal disease, again, this is with blood volume. Um, we're going to have more blood volume going to the kidneys. So we know that that can get worse as well. Um, family history, we always check for all of these, of course, diabetes, cardiac, hypertension, and then congenital abnormalities. So the patient may have had a congenital abnormality corrected that he or she does not know about. One of the big ones here is extra digits. So you can have an extra digit on the outside of your pinky finger. Um, and sometimes the, and then they just cut it off. Sometimes it has just skin. Sometimes it has skin and bone. Um, and so you want to ask, you know, did you have any of these or anybody in your family have any of these? Because the patient may not know that she had one of those. And then, of course, major congenital abnormalities we want to look for as well. Um, psychosocial factors, psychological status, educational needs, support systems, family functioning, economic and stability of living conditions. All of these support, support a healthy mental health pregnancy. And I think it's really, really important that we don't gloss over mental health needs. Um, if she's had previous um, psychiatric issues, such as uh, depression, uh, severe anxiety, um, bipolar, schizophrenia, any of those, you guys, j t typically during pregnancy, it's just a little better, but then after pregnancy, it becomes much, much worse. Um, during pregnancy, they can decompensate as well. So you really need to keep a close eye on them. Educational needs, make sure you're teaching them every time. And this helps her mental health because she knows what is happening. Support systems, um, you know, the family, um, you know, WIC for food, 
uh, things, things of those, you know, things of that nature. Family functioning, um, you know, a lot of families are dysfunctional. So if it's, you know, a really difficult situation or there's domestic violence, um, we need to give her information about that because that just makes all of it that much worse. Economic status, so does she have enough to um, feed herself? You know, is she working three jobs to try to keep her appoint apartment? And her stability of living conditions, is she couch surfing? Because she goes, that is really hard on a pregnancy, that you don't have stable living conditions. So we can refer them to social services, and um, we, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to kind of help them with this, but we have to screen them. Um, here is the past medical history, which is in the um, ACOG form. And you can see, you know, this is just your classic stuff. Um, you know, diabetes, psychiatric, vascular, um, trauma and violence, blood transfusion, alcohol, tobacco, street drugs, RH sensitization, asthma, allergies, breast surgery, GYN surgeries, complications from anesthesia, abnormal pap, infertility, family, re relevant family history. So these are all very important to like kind of look at where we're going in the future. You have to look at the past to know where you're going in the future. So now her obstetric history, we need to know, has she ever had a stillborn in the past um, and why? Has she had a habitual abortions? So abortion is the loss of a baby. Um, it doesn't mean that it was an induced abortion. It means that it was a loss of a baby. So have there been multiple losses? The number one reason for a habitual abortion is that the progesterone does not go up enough in the um, luteal phase and they lose the pregnancy I don't know, somewhere six, eight weeks um, because they don't have enough progesterone. So that would be this one. Cesarean birth, um, we want to know if they've had a surgery before. Um, that's super important and we need to get their records. RH or ABO sensitization, had they had, was the mom negative and had a positive baby? And was she given Rogam so that it prevented um, sensitization? Did she have a large baby in the past? And then did she have gestational diabetes in the past? And this is, this is the ACOG record, and this kind of shows you where um, it talks about her previous history. Uh, so when did she deliver? How old was the baby? How long was the labor? What was the birth weight? What was the sex of the, ba sex of the baby? What type of delivery? Was it a vaginal or a C-section? Did they have anesthesia? Uh, the place of the delivery? And was it preterm labor? And then were there any complications? Were there any complications? So current pregnancy, we want to make sure she's not exposed to uh, viral illnesses, um, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and um, herpes um, all have sequela uh, for the baby, so we don't want her exposed to any of those. And then STD exposure, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and HIV can all cause major changes and damage to the baby. So... Um, Cats in the home, cats in the home. So toxoplasmosis lives in the um, colon of cats. Um, and so I shouldn't say colon, I should say in the digestive tract of cats. But um, we want to know if they have cats because we don't want them to take out the kitty litter. Also, um, toxoplasmosis lives in the digestive tract of cows. And so if when you go to buy a steak, you know, that's a solid piece of meat um, that can be cooked, has to be at least 350 degrees on the outside to kill the toxoplasmosis. But inside it can be more rare because it's a solid piece of meat um, versus if you have a hamburger, which is all ground up pieces of meat, you have to cook that thing all the way through at 350 degrees in the middle. Um, to make sure that the toxoplasmosis is, is killed in the middle. So, um, yeah, got to make sure that you are on the ball for prevention of toxoplasmosis. Um, what can tox toxoplasmosis cause? It can cause um, um, brain damage and epilepsy in the neonate, and we definitely don't want to have that. Um, prior pregnancy problems, did you have any problems with your placenta before? Did the placenta come off, which is called an abruption? Or did the placenta cover your cervix, which is called a previa? Did you have multiple gestation? Did you have more than one baby? And did you have preeclampsia, which is elevated blood pressure um, with, with system changes? 
Um, so now we want to talk about her current symptoms. So now we're still taking her history or her story. Um, so what are her symptoms? Does she have nausea and vomiting? And, you know, that's kind of a good sign early in pregnancy. Um, breast fatigue, good sign. Fatigue and lethargy, sadly a good sign. Fetal movement, they should feel about around by 20 weeks, 15 to 20 weeks. Abdominal cramping or pain, you know, not a great sign. Has she had any vaginal discharge or ble bleeding, which is, you know, a warning sign for us. We worry about that one. And then urinary frequency, urgency, and dysuria are signs of UTI. And what we don't want to happen is that urine to travel up the ureters and infect her kidneys because your kidneys filter your blood. So you can get septic very, very quickly during pregnancy um, with ascending or upward bound UTIs. And here is all the um, information about screening um, and teratogen counseling infections, um, and then all of the things that we would worry about genetically. And there's you know, quite a bit. Physical examination, we're going to take their blood pressure. Hopefully it's um, stable at baseline. Their pulse, again, you know that they can have an increase in their pulse of 10 because the increased vascular volume respirations are slightly increased, but pretty much the same, and temperature should be the same. Oops, sorry about that. Um, physical examination, skin. So you guys, estrogen and progesterone cause a lot of skin changes. You get hyperpigmentation um, with estrogen. So you can get your little vessels can become dilated. Um, so you can have some spider nevi, which is these little tiny broken vessels. Chalasma, tan on your face, which is estrogen related. They call it mask of chalasma. Linnea nigra, which is the brown line um, from your um um, umbilicus to your pubis. Um, of course, you can get striae gravidarum, which are stretch marks related to pregnancy. And then dependent edema can be a normal. Dependent edema in your in, in your feet a little bit can be normal, but once it starts getting like plus four in your feet and legs, your hands are swollen, your face is swollen. These are very, very abnormal and ominous signs. You can say here's a little spider nevi. Here's chalasma, and it's the darkening of the face in the presence of elevated estrogen. Here's the Linnea nigra. You see it here. She has some darkening here. And then here's the striae gravidarum. Um, this was very, very rapid weight gain. We do not like that. Um, this is why in the first trimester that patients, it doesn't matter what they weigh, they should not gain more than five pounds. When you have this very rapid weight gain, it stretches out the skin because of the, the very rapid amount of pressure uh, underneath the skin. This is in the, um, in the sub Q um, and it stretches it and pulls it. And then this never goes away. It's sad. This will turn silvery gray, but these marks will still be there. So in physical exam, um, you want to check the nose. You can have some nasal stuffiness um, and, and nosebleeds epitaxis from the elevated estrogen. You Most women get gingival hypertrophy, um, which is um, swelling of the gums due to the elevated estrogen. And you tell them, please continue to do mouth care, continue to brush your teeth. I know your gums are swollen, but you need to continue this. Tylism is excessive saliva. Sometimes the saliva is so thick they have to spit it out, and that can be a source of fluid volume deficit because they're constantly spitting out their saliva. Um, so we can get really behind on our fluid. So we tell them to keep a water bottle with them at all times. Take many, many, many sips of water to um, thin out that thick saliva so they can swallow it. And then we know that the thyroid um, can enlarge, it enlarges up to a third. Um, by the third month to balance all the other elevated hormones. Heart should remain the same, um, regular rate and rhythm. Palpitations can occur because of the extra volume. And you may get short systolic murmurs. A, a murmur is turbulent blood flow. Systolic is when it's going through during the high pressure phase. Um, and it's because of that extra 1500 cc's of volume. So no big deal. A systolic murmur usually is benign. A diastolic murmur is always um, something to be concerned about. They're never normal. And then an S3, um, lub-dub-ch, lub-dub-ch, you get an extra sound. 
Um, it's just that extra volume that the heart's trying to pump. It can be normal only during pregnancy, but it should subside after pregnancy. Lungs should be clear. Um, breast, um, they usually get larger in size. Um, they, your nipples will darken due to the elevated estrogen and progesterone. Um, the areolas or areolas will darken. Superficial veins, because of all the blood volume coming here, will happen. Uh, colostrum, which is the first milk, may be present. And then striae or stretch marks may begin to appear um, because of the enlargement of the breast. These are Montgomery glands right here. See these little bumps? Um, these are great. These are oil secreting glands that keep your nipple moisturized. Um, so that when you're during, during your breastfeeding experience, it protects your nipple with this oil. Very, very awesome. Um, diastasis recti, that's the separation of the abdominal muscles, um, due to the uterus being behind it and pushing forward. Um, so you can have this a separation, this diastasis recti. Um, lordosis of pregnancy. So if you put your hands behind your back and you lean forward, um, what can happen is, is that it can cause more pressure on your back. So you want them to elevate their head like this lady is doing and not lean forward to keep her back in alignment and prevent lower back pain um, from lordosis of pregnancy. You can see here in the beginning, it was very small. And then as pregnancy comes, she leans forward. So we say really no really big high heels during the end of pregnancy. And we want them to pull up forward again to prevent this back pain. Oops, sorry about that. Um, progressive enlargement. So this is McDonald's rule. So this says that um, at 20 weeks, the uterus should be at the umbilicus. And every week thereafter, your uterus should go one centimeter. Okay, pretty easy. So if you're 20 weeks, it should be at the umbilicus. If you're 21 weeks, it should be at 21 centimeters from your pubic bone to the top of your uterus. At 26 weeks, it should be, or let's say 28 weeks, it should be from the pubic bone to the top of your uterus should be 28 centimeters. So we do take into account um, the small and the tall. And so um, if you're small, um, you might have up to negative, you may be a little bit shorter. You, your bundle height may be a little less. So let's say um, how to calculate that is when you're 28 weeks, we take into account the small, so it is normal to be 26 centimeters. And we take into account the tall, it is normal to be up to 30 centimeters. So the fundal height at 28 weeks should be 28 plus or minus 2. So, and then that is normal. But once you breach that plus or minus 2, let's say at 36 weeks, we should be anywhere from 34 centimeters to 38 centimeters. But let's say we were measuring 28 centimeters. That is definitely small. We have major problems. Or let's say at 36 weeks, we're measuring 44 centimeters. We know that is definitely big. So we want to make sure um, that we constantly measure from the, the fundal height to make sure we have adequate growing. So after 40 weeks, you guys, there's going to be a big burst of relaxin. And remember, that's the one that allows your pelvic um, pelvis to ligaments to separate and what's going to happen is that baby's going to slide down into the pelvis and look now there's not as much pressure on your stomach or your lungs and you feel like you can breathe and they call that lightning because your chest and stomach mm. feels lighter this is mcdonald's rule again um, it should be the gestational age plus or minus two weeks um, for the small and the tall and you can see that here I will test you on that and I will make sure you have to make sure that you are evaluating what the fundal height is in relationship to um, to uh, her gestational age and things to look for with those. You can see here's where they're measuring it from the pubis to the fundus. And here it is again and you can see and at 20 weeks it should be the umbilicus. You can see how it grows here. Um, abdom abdomen, we should be able to hear um, with a Doppler at 10 to 12 weeks, the heart rhythm of the fetus. And we always, anytime we get a fetal heart rate, we always palpate mom's radial artery and make sure that they are two different heartbeats, two different heartbeats. Um, 
we can go as low as 110 um, can be normal if it's been that way the whole time. Fetal movement should be felt by the mom by 20 weeks. Um, it's called quickening. Um, and then um, you can palpate them. So when you're doing your Leopolds or you know, you're putting on a monitor, you can feel it. Uh, contractions can be mild, moderate, or strong, mild, moderate, or strong, and that's by our hands palpating them. So mild contraction, like press on the tip of your nose, that's what it would feel like to indent the uterus. And then a moderate contraction, feel like pressing on your chin, so it's a little bit more firm. And then a strong contraction, press on your forehead and feel how hard that is. That's what a firm or strong contraction feels like. Um, uterine enlargement, we talked about that. We've already talked about Chadwick's, Hagar, and Goodell signs. Um, this is due to the increased blood volume. So Chadwick's sign, there's going to be a blue tint to the cervix. Hagar's sign, softening of the uterus on the sides. And Goodell's is softening of the uterus, of the cervix itself. Um, we will measure the, um, the uh, plane of least dimension, and that's the intertuberous diameter. So um, once we get inside of the, um, of the pelvis, we do hand measurements um, to feel how big it is. We also do an anterior posterior, so we feel how big it is from your pubic synthesis to your coccyx to make sure that the baby can come out. And remember, that's the diagonal conjugate. Um, we remember, though, that when we do these measurements initially in the first um, trimester, that we know they're going to change because of relaxant. Here's the physical exam um, as by our ACOG record. And then here's our lab test. I have a lab. I've done a lab quiz for you. So I've gone over every single one of those, and I want you to look at those separately. And we'll talk about them after you take your quiz. Um, at 8 to 18 weeks, we'll do ultrasounds. We can do um, amniocentesis. At 24 to 28 weeks, we check the hemoglobin, do a diabetes screen. Um, and if someone is um, Rh negative, the mom is Rh negative, we'll do an antibody screen and give them a GAM. And at 32 to 36 weeks, um, we do um, hemoglobin hematocrit, sometimes an ultrasound for size, check for syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, this is everybody right here. Um, and then we'll do a group beta strep um, screen, um, which is a normal bacteria, it's not an STI, it's, it's not, it's, it's a normal flora, but it can harm a baby, so we want to eliminate it, and you'll look at that in your lab quiz. Pelvic measurements, we already talked about that. Um, talked about, well, we, we'll talk about this in your lab quiz. And we've already, I've already kind of gone through this. So every single time that they come in, we check their fundal height. We do Leopold's for their presentation. Check the fetal heart tones. Look for preterm labor signs, blood pressure, non-dependent edema in the face and hands, which is very abnormal. Look at weight gain. Remember the first trimester, we want five pounds or less, the first trimester for every single patient. And then afterwards, it's divided equally um, by two. Um, ask about fetal movements. We want her to have consistent fetal movements. We want to teach and we want her to ask as many questions as she needs. So caring for the patient topics um, for teaching, nutrition and weight gain. Like we want them to have, you know, good weight gain. We don't want them to gain too little. We don't want them to gain too much. And we want good nutrition for the baby and for her. Fetal growth and development. Um, we want to talk to her about that. Discomforts of pregnancy. What can she do? Danger signs during pregnancy, sexual activity, they want to know um, what is okay and what is not okay. Um, and then sibling preparation. How are we going to tell these other kids about this new baby coming? We also have a quiz for diet, so we'll look at that and then we'll review that later. Um, so teaching topics, so the first trimester, your attitude towards pregnancy. Um, how do you feel about it? We want every woman to exercise during pregnancy. Pregnancy is a normal condition. You're not sick. You're not ill. There's nothing wrong with you. So we don't want you to be this ill person, um, you know, not exercising. Um, we want you to rest. Um, substance use and abuse. We want to make sure that we talk about that we don't want them to have any substance use or abuse. And if they do, um, we want to get them treatment. Um, 
is very important. Traveling, um, so you're pretty good to travel the first trimester. Um, you don't have a whole lot of harm. Of course, we know that we have extra blood volume. So we want you to, um, if you are traveling in a car, we would like for you to um, get out and walk around so that you don't have a DVT. So it's really important to get out and walk um, when you're sitting um, steady, when you have elevated estrogen like that. Second trimester, um, there are concerns related to body image, uh, fetal movement. Um, we want to make sure that we really endorse that because the number one best question we can ask a mom is, did you feel the baby move? When she feels the baby move, we know things are going very well inside. So fetal movement is super important clothing. We don't want any major restrictive clothing because we know it can cause problems. Care of the skin and breast. Um, so we don't want her to, um, you know, have problems with her breasts from, you know, old remedies or things like this in preparation for breastfeeding. And then decisions about feeding, infant feeding. Um, of course, we think breast is best, but um, infant feeding, if someone chooses not to breastfeed and they want to formula feed, that's fine. Um, we want to support them in their decision. We know that formula is fine for the baby. Um, so um, we want to show her how to do it. Third trimester, exercise and rest, traveling. This one, um, we don't want you to travel far. We don't want you to have a baby on a boat. We don't want you to have a baby on a plane. We don't want you to have a baby at a barbecue. So <laughs> we really are, you know, we don't want you to be isolated and go into labor and have this baby and the wherever you are not be prepared. Um, we also teach you about preparation for labor and birth, uh, decision making about early postpartum, who's going to help you, and birth control. Um, lactation amenorrhea or breastfeeding can help with prevention of ovulation, but um, you need supplementation for that. This is all the teaching we do. Yeah, lots and lots of teaching, labor signs, nutrition, breast or bottle. You gotta have a car seat. You gotta make sure that they have a car seat. Postpartum birth control, what are we gonna do for birth control after you have this baby? Work and environment hazards, we gotta teach them about teratogens. Nurses have a lot of teratogens. We have biohazards, bloodborne pathogens, chemotherapy, radiation, those are all major hazards. Are they gonna get their tubes tied? Um, are they going to have a are they going to have a VBAC or a, vag, a vaginal delivery um, after a cesarean? Is the baby going to have a circumcision? Circumcision. We always want to tell them about travel and then of course lifestyle. We don't want them to smoke or drink and do illegal drugs. We refer them to support groups um, to prenatal classes. So you guys, it's really important to say that when you don't know something and something is thrown at you, you have a major stress response. So you have epi, norepi, cortisol, and that's fight or flight. When you have those elevations in those hormones, that can cause increases in lactic acid, which, you know, can cause your contractions to hurt more. So the more informed they are and the more they know about what's coming, the theoretically less painful their labor is. And you guys, it's like if I told you the first day of class, you walked in and I say, hey, listen, we're taking a test today. I told you guys to read this stuff. Now we're going to take a test. You would be in fight or flight and you would be secreting tons of cortisol and, you know, epi and norepi and you would just be a mess. Um, same thing with them. This is why prenatal education is so very important so that they know what's coming. They can make decisions and feel comfortable. Common discomforts of pregnancy. So 70 to 90 percent of all women have nausea until 12 weeks. Um, that's from the elevated HCG, the estrogen and progesterone, and the HPL. So what do we want them to do? We want them to eat very small meals, dry crackers and toast to absorb that hydrochloric acid, avoid causative odors, and small frequent dry meals. You can see this picante sauce this kid was not too happy about. Urinary frequency. Um, so you guys don't drink in the evenings. Don't have a lot of fluid in the evenings because it will go to your bladder and then you'll pee all night. And this is like common stuff. Um, fatigue, lots of naps, seek assistance. 
breast tenderness, the breasts are sore. So we're a nice, well-fitting bra. Yeah, we don't want any of these. These are down here. Now she's got her cups up here. We want a nice, well-fitting bra to support her breast. Hygiene, leucorrhea is normal. Leucorrhea is white cells, uh, white discharge. And that's in response to elevated estrogen. And there's nothing wrong with normal leucorrhea. This is why you can have white cells on a urine dip that can be normal. Um, but what we don't want them to do is try to douche or to get this white discharge out. Um, it is a risk, risk for yeast infections because it's more moisture there. So we have to tell them keep everything nice and dry, um, nice and dry uh, so that you can, you know, um, prevent a yeast infection because yeast loves moist, dark environments. Um, nasal stuffiness, cool air vaporizer, or saline. We don't want you to have any type of um, nasal sprays or decongestants that um, cause a vasoconstriction in your nose because even though it's very small, the amount of vasoconstrictive, um, it can still go to your placenta and cause some damage. Tylosin, remember this was the excessive saliva. So we tell them they can use astringent mouthwashes, um, you know, to loosen the saliva. Chew on gum or suck on the hard candy and that thins the saliva. And of course, lots and lots and lots of water to thin it out and so that they can swallow it and not get dehydrated. Pyrosis. Okay, this is because you have heartburn because your uterus is pressing on your diaphragm, which is pushing your stomach up, which is causing you some reflux and some heartburn from your hydrochloric acid. So small frequent meals, low sodium antacid in Tums, no overeating, fat, fried and fatty foods, they cause us the most trouble because they have lots of, lots of hydrochloric acid expression after you have these. So um, very small meals for pyrosis. Dependent edema, just put your legs up. <laughs> so you know, then it becomes non-dependent. So um, that will help you. Foot exercises, dorsiflex, plantar stretch, um, varicosities, because the blood volume increases, um, all of the vascular in the second trimester will dilate out. So um, if you have a varicosity, which is a broken um, valve in one of your um, vessels, there's going to be more blood in that, vessels, in that vessel because that valve is still broken. So elevate the legs frequently. Put on support hose, right? That's going to Give a little bit of compression to help that blood flow go back to where it's supposed to go. Avoid standing for prolonged periods and avoid crossing your legs. Constipation. Um, remember, progesterone can cause constipation. So increase fluids, fiber, and exercise. All of those things for anyone with constipation. And then regular bowel movements. We don't want you to get super constipated because that can cause you to have a hemorrhoid. Hemorrhoids in pregnancy are a common occurrence. Um, it's usually from constipation. So... Um, if we try to screen you and see if you have a history of constipation, if so, many times we'll give you a stool softener um, with, I mean, we'll give you a prenatal vitamin with a stool softener, which helps you. Um, in the prenatal vitamin, we give you iron, and iron can cause more constipation. So it is a double-edged sword, so that's a nice little compromise as a prenatal vitamin with a stool softener. Again, ice packs, topical ointments, tuck pads to decrease the swelling of this hemorrhoid, warm soaks or sit bath, sits bath, and then we go back again and we're going to add all of this, increased fluids, fiber, and exercise. So um, most of these recede um, after delivery because the, the vascular volume is decreased and um, they get so much better. Backache, we just tell you to do pelvic tilts, so push your pelvis up and then down. Here she is on all fours and this will help her immensely. Um, abdominal pain or ligament stretching. So you have ligaments um, that, that hold your uterus in place. You have a round ligament that goes across the top and you've got these, um, these round ligaments here on the sides and these are all stretched. And so if you're having any kind of ligament pain, we tell you don't overreach, don't overstretch. So if she wants to get something here, we tell her to put her foot on on a box so it decreases the amount of ligament stretching we have here see because if she had her foot down here she would have more stretching on the side as she leaned over to to get these files and then heat is good warm bath um, a heating pad leg cramps uh, we want to dorsiflex the feet to stretch 
Okay, we want to have choice of flags. We never want to plant our flags because that can make it worse. So we pull your toes to your nose, your toes to your nose, just like when we do an assessment for a home inside. We know that the, that the uterus um, can press on the inferior vena cava. So if this dude had a big gigantic uterus here and was pressing on the inferior, inferior vena cava, we know that that can decrease the blood pressure, the blood flow back to mom. So if, she, if he were to jump up, um, we know that that could cause faintness or decrease blood or oxygen to your brain. So we don't want you to have sudden changes in position and we want you to prolong, uh, avoid prolonged standing. Here's the inferior vena cava. See all this gigantic uterus, how it can sit on there. So we never take the blood pressure flat. Uh, we don't want you to lay flat. We want you to lay on your side because just this, just, 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 excuse me, just this small, even if it's like for two or three minutes, amount of pressure on this inferior vena cava, it can lower mom's blood pressure and the amount of oxygen she delivers to the gap alive and it can cause problem with the baby so this is why we always tell you to lay on your side or at least to tilt dyspnea is never good we never want you to have difficulty breathing elevate for uh evaluate for severity so they need if somebody says i'm having trouble breathing and they're pregnant believe them tell them to come in for an evaluation posture are they sitting forward we want to evaluate that and then sometimes they just can't lay flat or they can't lay um they need their head elevated, I should say that, to decrease the amount of pressure on their lungs. And so sometimes they're not having true dyspnea. They're just, they're having trouble with the uterus pressing up and it's causing them to be uncomfortable as they sleep. Um, symptoms since the last period. We always want to know stuff like this. Nutrition, um, this is incorrect. So if you listen to this video or you go to lecture, you'll know. And so on the test, you'll get it correctly. Um, we want you to increase your calories by 330 kilocalories in the second and third trimester. Um, if you're having twins, you're going to double that. So if you're not eating for two, you're eating an extra chicken breast, which is 330 calories. Um, increase complex carbs, which is your primary source. Increase proteins um, for fetal development and growth of maternal and fetal tissue. Um, fat chain, fat is unchanged. We need more iron. We know that because we have physiologic anemia and then vitamins, folic acid, we need to increase to prevent neurotube defects. We need to start monitoring fetal movements. And again, that's the number one question to ask someone when they come in with problems. Have you been feeling the baby move? If they say no, that's very, um, ominous and we need to make sure that we evaluate this baby. Clothing, non-restrictives. This is a little pelvic girdle that kind of helps pull upward so that gravity doesn't pull so much down on the uterus. Low heeled comfortable shoes are really important to prevent back pain. Um, a nice well-fitting bra. Avoid soaps on the nipples, soaps or anything to the nipples. If they have inverted nipples, we can put these little shells over them. These are great. These are called nipple shells. And um, they will put counter pressure on the nipple and sometimes they can allow the nipple to pop out. Hoffman's exercises when you actually pull your nipples out, um, like you just pull on them to try to break the adhesion that's keeping the nipple inverted behind there. Um, this is usually from birth. People have ad adhesions um, that just causes it to invert. Avoid hot showers and hot baths. Um, this is because you, say for instance, you get into a hot tub and you're going to vasodilate all of your skin out. So the blood volume is going to go to your skin and it's not, and less is going to go to the gap. So we don't want you to do that. Employment, be very careful of phytotoxic environments. Um, there's lots of teratogens, um, just everywhere. Um, Nurses, I've already talked about that. And avoid prolonged, uninterrupted periods of standing or sitting. You want to be up and down. Travel, no restrictions until that third trimester, and definitely tell them to walk around. Self-care, rest, activity, modify it. No high-risk activities with balance and coordination. So we say you can lightly jog as long as you don't get out of breath. We don't want you to heavily perspirate uh, or have heavy perspiration um, if you're getting really wet, that tells you that we're losing precious um, hydration 
which is super important. Um, and we can even use the first thing that is used when you're really hot during pregnancy is your amniotic fluid. So if you're constantly sweating the whole time during pregnancy, you can have decreased amniotic fluid, which is not good um, because that can limit the amount of lung maturation and um, GI maturation or urine maturation, kidney maturation in the neonate. So um, you can jog as long as you don't get out of breath. You have to be able to talk. That tells us that you're okay. Um, and we don't want you to have too much perspiration. We don't want you to lay in the sun and bake because that you'll cool yourself with that amniotic fluid first. And then high risk activities. Um, we don't want you to skateboard, surf, anything that you might fall down and hurt your baby. <laughs> so, um, you know, you have to take all those into consideration. Things to prepare for childbirth, we can do abdominal tightening, partial sit-ups, which increases this um, strength of your core, and that can help you push the baby out. Kegel exercises is when you squeeze the muscles that control urine flow. These are super important. We should be doing these every single day from the moment we are children. And then Taylor sitting is this, and it kind of helps the, the ligaments to stretch out um, without being under an immense pressure. Sex is fine, with the exception of preterm labor, bleeding, or rupture of membranes. Okay? Sex is fine, with the exception of preterm labor, bleeding, or rupture of membranes. Um, and you need alternate positionings. That's so important. Like, you do not want missionary position because that could cause excessive pressure on the fetus. Um, I tell this to patients all the time. And they say, well, what position should we go in? And I say, that's up to you, but just not missionary. <laughs> so you're going to have to figure that out on your own. I'm not going to look at pictures or anything like that. Dental care. Always get your dental care. Um, you want to continue to brush your teeth. If you have a teeth that ne tooth that needs to be extracted, they can put local there. But we don't want any dental x-rays or extensive dental work during pregnancy. Immunizations, we definitely want you to get 100% without fail your COVID vaccine when you're pregnant because it is so important. Um, I can't tell you we have study after study after study after study. And we've seen patient after patient after patient that's had poor fetal outcomes and maternal outcomes after COVID. Um, the, the vaccination is safe, uh, safe for the baby. Um, and it can protect uh, protect both of them. So COVID vaccine is number one for this population is specifically. Um, flu vaccine, number, uh, number two for this population, very important. Um, and then they can get um, uh, a Tdap, um, dip, uh, tetanus, uh, diphtheria, pertussis. And that's really important. They should get those vaccines during pregnancy. Any other vaccines they should not get. This was our teratogen, so we already talked about it. So teratogenic substances. So you can see problems with the fetus. It may be apparent during the pregnancy. We might have problems during the pregnancy. At birth, we may see physical signs of a teratogenic exposure. Or years later, we may see that they have mental issues or they have developmental milestone or developmental delays which are causing problems. So here's some more of the teratogens, radiation, alcohol, drugs, hormones, yeah, cigarettes, German measles, lead and mercury. And we have to tell them we don't want them to have more than one serving of um, fish that is a heavy mercury content fish like um, tuna um, per week. Um, the effects are gestational dependent, so the earlier they're exposed to this, the worse it can be. So let's say um, they were exposed to, let's say, I don't know, um, um, radiation at during the age of, um, th during the time of organogenesis, like during the first eight weeks, we can have definite organ damage to all of them. Or let's say that they were exposed to radiation and mom was already 38 weeks. Obviously, it's not going to be as much. And then it's dose related. How much did they get? Did they get a little exposure or did they get a lot of exposures um, caused by environmental toxins, radiation, medications? Tobacco, lower birth weight. We've already talked about that. We don't want them. Any decrease in smoking during pregnancy increases um, fetal increased. It, it helps with our fetal outcomes. 
alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, so we don't know how much is okay, so we have to say none at all. This is what they look like. They have a small head and small brain, hippocampal folds here on the sides, um, low nose bridge, indistinct philthrum, um, small chin. You can see how they all look very similar. Um, caffeine is not a teratogen. Um, there's no evidence, but it does decrease maternal iron absorption. Um, and it can lend to increased uh, losses in the first trimester. Cocaine is a huge one. Oh my gosh. Severe congenital abnormalities because it messes with the vasculature, including urinary, cardiac, CNS. High incidence of abruptia placenta, which we'll talk about. Preterm labor, fetal distress, and low birth weight. Of course, if you're addicted to cocaine and the baby comes out, the baby's addicted to cocaine. So when they begin to withdraw, they can have jitterinus, poor feeding, and seizures. So the pregnancy categories, um, A's and B's are good. C's, there's the uh, risk to benefit is, um, there can there are risk and there are benefits. And I don't know why it's not showing up here. I think it's because of my coloring. But A's and B's are the ones we really kind of want to go with. Um, D. Evidence of fetal risk does exist, but the benefits outweigh the risk. And in this one, a big one here is Xanax. So let's just say that mom um, is suicidal or has extreme anxiety. And we know that there is fetal risk. So when she goes to psychiatry, they will say, you know, this will hurt the baby. We know that there's risk to hurt the baby. But if she commits suicide, of course, she kills herself and the baby. So everything we do is a risk to benefit um, variable. And then category X, there are no, um, there are, there is nothing good that can come out of this only fetal risk. We've talked about this. Um, take your vitamin um, at bedtime is the least amount, least amount of problems. Iron supplement, best absorbed on an empty stomach. Stool softeners. Um, colace or surfac because you know with the progesterone causes um, constipation and then pericolase is a stool softener plus the stimulant. I will have some antipartum medications that you need to know. We definitely need to know the what why we would take prenatal vitamins. Iron supplementation, what it does increases um, iron availability, decreases anemia, the side effects can cause major constipation and how to take it you take it on an empty stomach with a um, citric acid to help potentiate it like orange juice. Now, might that make them throw up? Yes, it may. So they may not tolerate it like that. So you may have to say you're going to have to figure out the best way you can do it. And then, of course, know your drug classes. That's it for um, pregnancy. So and this is a low risk pregnancy. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.